Uh, thank you for coming uh, to this talk. Uh, my name is Carlos Sanchez, and that's my Twitter handle. If you want to talk about the session, how good it is, don't say how bad it is. Let's forget about that. It's going to be great. Um, so I'm going to talk about Kubernetes and Docker. Um, if you have been on Victor's talk this morning, microservices, all that theory, I'm going to show you how to put some of that in practice, like the real thing and in a very easy way to try, I hope. Um, so before we start, OK, how many of you are using Docker in some way or another? Pretty much like 60%. Who, who has heard about Docker? <laughs> OK, that, that, that's good. This was not like that like a year ago or two years ago. Um, and who has heard about Kubernetes? Okay. And using Kubernetes at all? Nobody. It, just just Victor here. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm gonna show you how if you are a little bit familiar with containers and Docker, I'll I'll show you how to uh, extend that uh, learn uh, the the part about above that with Kubernetes. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm, I'm a senior software engineer at CloudBees, the company behind Jenkins now, although I, I just joined back in April. I wrote the Jenkins Kubernetes plugin. Uh, it's an easy way to try Jenkins in, with Kubernetes. And I've been working with open source for like the last 12, 13 years, something like that. Um, so with, with that, so you know where I come from. I come from mostly the development side. Uh, writing things, um, uh, writing Maven, and all this development tooling. So, uh, just a quick introduction to containers and microservices for uh, for some of you. Um, basically, what Docker is doing just is hiding all the complexity behind Linux containers, LXC, and all these kernel capabilities, and it's adding on top of that uh, the file system, users processes, network, isolation. Um, and it's using this union file system when you have layers on Docker, basically you are installing things one on top of the other and you have multiple layers that basically combine into what a Docker image is. Um, so what with containers, I mean, you heard, if you were at the Victor talk, everything is great with containers, Docker, everything is awesome there, but it's not just trivial. It's, it's a bit more complicated than just what you can hear of what should be done or how can it easily be done with the real world when you have to deal. This is actually uh, how containers were unloaded from some ship in the Caribbean. They would take the containers on the boats to the shore. So, and, and another great quote that I, I love to use is from Colonel Sanders. <laughs> The solution, Docker, the problem you tell me. Basically, nowadays, Docker is the solution for any problem. Whatever problem you have, if you hear about the, the nail and the hammer, once you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail, then Docker is something like that. So you got to be uh, used to discern whether Docker is the right thing for you and, and it's the right time. So some of the things we are doing with, with Docker, or I've done with Docker, is uh, in the Docker Hub, you have all this repository of official images and other images that people create. Uh, so I contribute to the official Jenkins image, uh, and I created the official Maven image and a bunch of other re build development related tools. Um, so that's, this is the official one. Then we have the Jenkins CI slash Jenkins, which is like a weekly uh, build the same thing that you can find in the Jenkins uh, uh, project, you can get it from, from a Docker image. So it's a great way to just run Docker inside a container and uh, without having to download a war and a web application server and so on. And uh, the other image that I'm gonna use here in these examples is the JNLP slave. Basically, Jenkins can uh, Delegate all this work to the slaves, and if you have a Docker image with the slave installed, 
you can start that image and have just one slave, another slave, and another slave, and deals will come up all in Jenkins and be all ready to do, to do the jobs. So how many of you are using Jenkins? Jenkins users? Uh, more like Jenkins admin type of people that have to deal creating jobs and things like that? Okay. <laughs> um, so if you've seen uh, slaves before, um, yeah, how, are you using slaves? Who is using slaves? Or just, okay, some of you are using slaves. I guess the rest are using just the Jenkins master with executors and running things on the master. This is, uh, using slaves is a way to just delegate the job, the work to, to different machines. So in a microservices world, then this would fit with that idea of having separate processes running separately and just communicating with each other. So with all that, I'm gonna jump into what Kubernetes is. So um, one of the creators of, well, one of the creators of Kubernetes, he says, uh, this is uh, Kelsey Hightower from CoreOS, it's like, how would you design your infrastructure you could not log in ever? So that's one of the ideas of today's modern architectures, like all, having all these services and having like health checks and exposing APIs and things like that. So you don't have to SSH into the service and I individual servers. And there's some, the other analogy that you can hear from DevOps people uh, saying, treat your servers like cattle, not as pets. So you don't care about the individual servers anymore. You just care about having X number of servers running. You don't care if this individual one is running or not. You just care about the whole state. Um, so that's one of the things that Kubernetes allows you to do. So what it does is basically con container cluster orchestration. Once you use Docker, then in one Docker host, you fig figure out this is not gonna be enough, right? How can I run this Docker container across multiple hosts? So there's been a lot of uh, tools to deal with that, and Kubernetes is one of them. Um, Kubernetes calls uh, these different hosts nodes, or previously they were called minions, and provides a higher level API that basically allows you to not deal with individual nodes or hosts, but deal with uh, like a higher level API about services and the status of the service and so. And it's very important that it cares a lot about state. It doesn't care about actions. So instead of saying, do this and then do that and then do this other thing, you just say, I want like 50 containers running. You don't say, start, 50, start one server, start another server, start 50 servers. You don't do that. You basically say, I want 50 servers running or 50 containers running. Just Kubernetes will handle that for you. And also that's monitoring. So basically, we'll detect if your services are not running or if some issue happened, and it will take care of maintaining that state. So maybe in a picture, um, so you have the multiple nodes running with the container, with uh, Kubernetes, and you get the containers, and Kubernetes, the, the master will have the API, and will decide well, where that container is gonna be run. So the master basically does, has the API server and uh, cares about scheduling and synchronization. It uses etcd behind the scenes, like to keep the state, and uh, implements this replication algorithm using etcd. So basically you talk to the master, to the API, and the master will take that your orders and ensure that across the nodes that's gonna happen. So it's like the brain. And then in every node you have running Docker, obviously. Um, you have another service called Kubelet that basically checks the state of pods and communicates back to the master. Um, you have a simple network proxy called Kubernetes proxy to, to ensure that the networking is, uh, I mean, the ports that you want to be exp exposing, they are gonna ro route to the right container. It also uses etcd. And there's some extra features or optional um, services. One is a Sky DNS, which is basically a um, dynamic DNS service 
that will allow you to use names to reference to the different services you have and do service discovery. And also Elasticsearch and Kibana for getting the logs across all the containers, across all nodes in a centralized way. So the mas you have one master node, you have multiple workers. Um, this would be in the typical installation. And there's something interesting about how Kubernetes does some things, like in the master node, it has two Docker servers running. This maybe is going into much detail. Um, but uh, then in the, in the nodes is where the actual things happening, all the containers run. So, and how, where can you use Kubernetes? I mean, Kubernetes runs pretty much under any um, underlying infrastructure provider. So you have Google Container Engine, JKE. J -K -E. Uh, you can run it in Azure and VMware, and you can also run it on-premise and on virtual in your development machine, on Vagrant, on uh, CoreOS, uh, Amazon, AWS, whatever. You just pick whatever provider you want, and they have installation instructions for, for each of them. And the way to create a cluster, once you download Kubernetes, basically you say what, what my pro provider is, uh, JC for Google Cloud uh, Compute Engine. You say how many minions, and um, maybe now it's nodes, uh, how many nodes you want, and you say two or three or whatever number you want, and you just run this cube app script, and it will talk to the cloud provider, and it will do the magic. And you can also say, like Kubernetes provider Vagrant, that's the typical way to, to start, like use Vagrant with uh, virtual machines running on VirtualBox, and you can do the same thing and have like a local cluster. And obviously, this is a project that was started by Google, using their knowledge of a lot of years working with containers. And one of the things they did was create Google Container Engine. Basically, you go to the Google Cloud uh, console and you say, I want, I want to create a new container cluster, which is basically Kubernetes running behind the scenes. Just go in, fill the fields, and say how many nodes you want, in what song, what mach machine type, and what's the size of your cluster. And Google will do that for you. And we'll take care of, of the infrastructure side of it, and we'll tell you uh, where the API is running and so on. And the other way is to do the same thing through the command line. Uh, basically, with the, uh, the G Cloud command line, you can, you can do the same thing. Um, OK, so there's several concepts you have to know when you deal with Kubernetes. One was like Node, I already mentioned that. Um, nothing really, the interesting part is like you can query the API and it will get you data about the Node. You can associate labels with anything, basically, in Kubernetes, with the node or with any of the other objects. So with the node, uh, you will get also the capacity, like how, much, how many CPUs do you have in this node, how, many me how much memory, and what's the IP address, and all that sort of information. And if you associate labels, then you will be able to do fancy stuff, like saying, I want this container to run in nodes that match this label. Like, that no, in nodes that are in this song. The other important part, uh, important object in Kubernetes, or maybe is the most important one, is the pod. The pod is a, is a group of containers, so instead of having just one container, you can have a group of them and make sure that they are always uh, started in the same node and they are always running together. So imagine you have like a web server container and a cache. Uh, you want them to run in next to each other because obviously you don't want the, the cache to be in another node and, and your web server in a different node and so on. You could do that here. And if you have any other sort of constraints like that, you can do that, put them, all these containers in, in one pod. They share the same IP, which is another very interesting uh, thing that you may want to do. So they, you can talk to each, co the containers in the same pod can talk to each other using localhost. 
And you can pass environment variables like any Docker container, and also has this uh, share volumes specification. I'll, I'll show you in, in an example later, but the idea is basically you can mount volumes in the same way you mount volumes with, with Docker, and the volumes can come from host, like in Docker. Um, but the interesting part is that Kubernetes provides uh, drivers to uh, mount volumes from Google Compute Engine disks, Amazon EBS volumes, and then other sort of uh, distributed file systems like ClusterFS and, and obviously uh, NFS. And Secrets is a specific one that will basically ensure that, that whatever you store in there is never so safe to disk. So if you want to store like a password or something like that. But the volumes part is one of the uh, interesting parts of Kubernetes because it's something that provides across multiple nodes that uh, Docker by itself doesn't provide yet. So basically, your client talks to the Kubernetes master. You have three nodes here, and you have the Kubelet service running, and then uh, Kubernetes will start the pods across the nodes, figuring out uh, where to do it and how to do it. Um, can you see this from the back? OK. Um, this is what a definition of a pod is. You say, there's always met metadata, what I mentioned before. You can have labels. I'm using the Jenkins label to refer to this pod. And then I define what containers I want to run. I, I define what image. In this case, is the Jenkins swarm image that I created. What ports you want to expose and what volumes you want to mount. So here I'm using a host path. So I'm saying, take my, the host home Docker Jenkins and mount it into the Jenkins home. I mean, obviously, this is not going to work in, in a distributed architecture. This, uh, this is going to use the, the, the volume mounted from the host. But you get the idea of how to, how to. So it's basically the same thing that you do for a Docker container, plus the volume mounts and exposing the ports and attaching some metadata. And the replication controller is another concept of Kubernetes and basically is saying how many pods do you want to run? So you can say, I want three of these three pods always running. You create a replication controller that says, I want three pods running all the time and Kubernetes will take care of that. And it will also support, the, the CLI allows you to do a rolling update, which basically says if you, want, if you want to upgrade like three nodes, three pods that are running on a replication controller, it will allow, this re uh, rolling update will allow you to take one offline, create a new one of the, of the new type, take another one offline, create a new one, and so on, so you don't kill all of them at the same time. And it will, if I say I want three, three instances of pod A and two instances of pod B, Kubernetes will take care of where to schedule those containers. It obviously will, will t uh, consider things like how much, memory does, uh, how much memory your pod requires, how much memory the node has, how many CPUs, if, the, if there's some conflict with ports and things like that. But after that, I mean, you can specify constraints. And then he, he, Kubernetes will figure out where to, where to run this. So you could say easily say, I want uh, 100 web servers running. And this define what the, what the image is. And Kubernetes will start 100 containers across all hosts. And, and that takes me to a great DevOps Borat quote, which is, to, to make errors human, to propagate error to all servers in an automatic way, that's what DevOps is, right? You create a replication controller of 100, you make some mistake, and then suddenly it's like everywhere. <laughs> I've done this before several times, actually. Um, and what the replication controller definition is, is basically like a pod definition where you say how many replicas you have, how many replicas you, you want to have. In this case, just one replica. And uh, in the spec, same thing as in the pod, 
definition, you say what image you want to run, what ports you want to expose, what volumes you want to mount. And, and that, that's pretty much it. The other uh, thing that Kubernetes, the other object or model object that they have is, is the services, uh, which allows you to do uh, pod discovery, right? Once you have all these pods running, or containers running across multiple nodes, the first question is like, how do I reach them? I mean, how do I get from the web server to the database, or how do I get from this place to this other place, right? And obviously, if I run 10 of them because I want to scale, how do I find which one to go to? So that's what service is doing, Kubernetes. It allows you to find uh, pods based on, on the labels, typically, and it gives you a new IP for each service. It will find what pods are uh, fit that service criteria. Like if you say label equals Jenkins, which is what I'm, I'll show, is basically saying, give, get me to the Jenkins server, uh, and if there are multiple of them, the services will uh, load balance doing, I think it's round robin by default. And also in cloud providers, obviously, Compute uh, container engine and AWS, it can create uh, external load balancers. So in AWS, that's called an elastic load balancer, and in Google Container Engine, is, uh, I don't remember exactly the name, but it's, it's an, a load uh, also gives you an external internet public facing IP that goes into the containers and it will uh, round robin the uh, the connection to the to the containers that are that are matching your service. So Google is making it so Google Cloud is the very first place to run Kubernetes. I mean, this is the easiest place where you can run it. It's always going to work, and it's tested, and so on. And, and so, if you want to try it, Kubernetes, I recommend using Container Engine. So. You connect to the service, you get the, the service has its own IP. The pods have, each of them have their own IP. So the service will forward your connection to the right place. And how do you define it? You have um, several, three types of services. Um, maybe it's, okay. So you have the load balancer one is, um, is the one that will create an external, I think it's the one that will create the, the external public facing um, IP in the pr if the provider supports it. So I'm saying here, expose the port 80 publicly and point it to the port 8080 of the containers because the Jenkins uh, image exposes 8080 by default. And it's port also, this is the, the port 50,000 is the, the port where the slaves connect. So not very, you just have to have it, but not, not very important for the example. And my service just match anything that, any pod whose name matches is Jenkins. So this service is gonna throw anything you, ha you send through the load balancer or the service IP on port 80, is going to end in one of the control on the of the pods that matches the name Jenkins in the port 8080. So that's basically what services do: is finding the way from from the uh, outside to the specific uh, specific containers. Now, networking is is a bit complicated in Kubernetes because it uses it uses vir virtual networking. Um, so. All containers can communicate with all other containers you see, because each pod is going to have their own IP. And uh, all nodes can communicate with containers and vice versa. And the container always see the same IP. And what I mentioned before, pods can talk using local hosts. This is a bit complicated. And the only cloud that supported this was cloud, uh, Google Cloud. If you run Kubernetes in some other place, you have to use CoreOS Flannel, which basically creates an overlay network. I mean, this is just advanced Docker installation where uh, you want to have uh, individual IPs for each container and not each node. 
and then you can create like firewall rules for containers, individual containers, um, and things like that. So this is, let's say, advanced topic. And another interesting way, uh, this I have the example online, so you don't don't really care too much about uh, seeing. You can run doc Docker uh, a small like Kubernetes testing environment using Docker Compose. If you know what Docker Compose is, is just basically a way to start in a Docker server like several uh, images together. Um, so there's an example out there that if you don't want to go, I mean, you want to see quick one host Kubernetes environment, uh, you you can do that. But I think I jumped too fast to the to the Docker Compose part. Um, some related projects, Docker Machine, obviously the one that allows you to create the Docker hosts and replace, replaces boot to Docker. Um, so you, with Docker Machine, you can create the Docker host anywhere you want uh, in different cloud providers. It, it will create Docker host for you. Um, another interesting one is Docker Swarm because people, a lot of people ask, what's the difference? Be who, who has heard about Docker Swarm? Okay, not not a lot of people, but so Docker Swarm is basically a clustering of Docker hosts. Um, this is a project that is not that old, and it also answers the question of how do I manage multiple Docker hosts. So basically, you can have Docker Swarm expose the Docker API, and behind the scenes, it will talk to a bunch of Docker hosts. So basically, uh, you get one Docker API, and you talk to multiple hosts behind. And um, it's different from Kubernetes in the, in the sense that it only exposes the Docker host API. And it doesn't do anything of the other stuff I mentioned. It doesn't do like state uh, control, it doesn't do service discovery, it doesn't do an, any extra things on top of the Docker API right now. I mean, in, in the future, maybe. And Docker Compose uh, is the orchestration of multiple con uh, Docker containers. This is the evolution of what Fig used to do. So basically, you can have a file where you define multiple containers and the images and the volumes, and it will run those for you in, in a host. And uh, 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 I'm gonna just mention Apache Mesos because it's, it's another orchestration, container orchestration system. Uh, who's heard of Apache Mesos? All right. I mean, this is older, so it's more tested. Um, and it's also, uh, Basically, it started as, as a, like a task scheduler. Before, it was just processes. At some point, a Docker uh, scheduler was created, so you could also schedule Docker containers. And there's, you can run on top of Mesos things like Hadoop, Kafka, Spark, and um, typically for long running processes, what you would run is Marathon, which is another service that basically keeps uh, track of what containers are running and where, and ensures that there's always some number of containers running. And you can run Kubernetes on top of Apache Mesos if you wanted to. I mean, this is maybe too much if you are not that familiar with, with it. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the example. Um, so what I'm gonna run is Jenkins running on Kubernetes. Something simple that everybody's familiar with. Um, so, what, one of the things uh, that you have to 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 know about pods and replication controllers is that I should have mentioned this before. The replication controllers ensures that there's always some a, a specific number of uh, containers running. Pods, on the other hand, never get rescheduled in a different node. So this is a something, a limitation that you need to be aware of, because if some, if you're running a pod, so let's say if I run the Jenkins master in a pod instead of a replication controller, and 
if the Docker container gets killed or my Jenkins master dies for whatever reason, then Kubernetes will restart it. It, will, it, it monitors that the services are always running or the pods are always running. Now there's with one caveat though. If you use a pod and the host dies, Kubernetes is never gonna move a pod to a different node. So that's, that's the main use case to run Jenkins Master as a replication controller of just one element. You just want one instance, but you want a replication controller and not a pod just for that reason. If I run the Jenkins Master as a replication controller and my node dies for whatever reason, because I kill it, because I stop it, because curl dumps, whatever, Kubernetes will notice that and will move my Jenkins master container to another node. So that's, that's the reason why you don't use, well, you wouldn't use pods in a lot of cases, even if you, have, if you, even if you just want one container running. Because replication controllers will ensure that, uh, that the container is restarted anywhere, anytime. So I'm gonna show you a replication controller with Jenkins master running using a Google persistent disk as Jenkins hub, running on Google container engine. This will ensure that if my Jenkins master dies and needs to be moved to a different node, Kubernetes is gonna ensure that the persistent disk is attached to that new node whenever the uh, Jenkins master is started. So basically we have now fully uh, resilient uh, <laughs> um, disaster recovery in whatever node my Jenkins master is running. If for whatever reason I destroy that node it's gonna move and it's gonna keep the data and it's gonna come back up in a different node with the same data. And I'm gonna show you, so I'm gonna have slaves connected to the master that will, are gonna be the ones doing the actual jobs, the, all the tasks, whatever it is. And uh, for that, it's pretty more obvious that I'm using a replication controller where I say, I want three slaves or I want five slaves I want one, one slave. And I can do that from the command line and say how many slaves I want and let Kubernetes decide where the, those uh, slaves are run. And if, if you, uh, so this would be like, the, this is a sample I'm gonna show you running on Kubernetes. And uh, if you are very interested, there's also the Kubernetes Jenkins plugin that does this, uh, does the creation of slaves on demand. So basically, you don't even have to define what size of your, rep of your slaves you want. It will figure it out. But um, that's a task if you want to, to deal with that later. So let me go back to, let me show you the example. OK. So I'm gonna start from a running cluster and I'll destroy it and bring it up, bring it back up. Um, so I got all the pods and I got all the, the replication controllers and everything running. And I have a Jenkins master and this IP and I have two slaves connected to that, right? And this is the container engine. And basically, I have a cluster of three. Uh, so th I have three nodes with, uh, with Kubernetes running. So um, let's see, the Google master, the Jenkins master. So this is some of the stuff that I had in, in, the, in the slides. But basically, I have one replica, and I'm using this image Jen uh, Jenkins Swarm is the plugin uh, that allows you to connect multiple slaves from the slave to the master. Uh, basically, you start slaves, tell them where the master is, and it will automatically connect when they come up. And this is all on GitHub if, if you wanna look, uh, look at it later on. And I'm saying, well, I suppose the port 8080 and 50,000 uh, that I need before, 
And here at the bottom, maybe okay. Here is that's better. At the bottom, I'm saying using a persistent disk with this name that matches uh, the volume mount. So Jenkins data is mounted on the var Jenkins home. So everything that is in the Jenkins home is stored in a Google uh, persistent disk. And whenever I restart, if I kill the container and start it later on, it's going to have the same data. And I have the slaves definition, which is more or less the same. I can set here the number of replicas. I'm starting with one. I use the image for the swarm slaves. Basically, this just has a small, it has Java and a small jar. And I tell this, this basically when you start this Java app, you can say, go to this IP and connect to the master. So now the interesting part is service discovery. How do I find out where the master is running? So for that, I use a combination of SkyDNS and the, Jenkins, the Kubernetes environment variables that it says when, whenever you create a new service. So basically, these are the two parameters I need to, the, the two important parameters, right? Jenkins is a service that I have created that matches the pod that I showed you before. So whenever I try to DNS resolve Jenkins, it's going to give me the IP of the pod that is running. And Kubernetes also uh, set up some environment variables for any container that it starts. So Jenkins service port HTTP and Jenkins service port slave are environment variables that come from the service. So I have defined the service. I have said, expose the port HTTP 88, uh, or 8080, I think he said. Export, uh, export the slave port in 50,000. And anything that I start after defining that service is going to have these environment variables that are going to help me find out where the master is. And the service. Basically, just a load balancer service that does that. The HTTP service and the slave service name, um, sorry, port names, saying expose the port 8080 as port 80, export the port 50,000 as whatever port you want. And this is going to create the load balancer for me. And OK, so let me destroy the whole thing. Um, doo -doo -doo. Can you see that on the back, or I make it a bit bigger? So I can say kubectl get pods, and I have no, no pods running. And I will uh, create, I can say get nodes too. And it will show me the three nodes that I have in Google Container Engine running. I will create the master one. Oops. So it has gone and, and do that. I get go do the get pods, and I get my Jenkins master is running somewhere. And if I get the, re the replication controllers, I have the Jenkins replication controller with this image, and I have one replica. And if I create the service now, basically, if I want to access any running container or any running pod, I need a service to make it publicly accessible. So I can get services. And my service is created, Jenkins. And I can do describe services slash Jenkins. And it's going to tell me what IP has the service assigned. And this is the IP. 
This is obviously internal for the cluster, but the slaves can connect to this AP file, to this service IP. And this is going to be load balancer. I only have one instance, but uh, this is the way the slaves can find, find out where the master is. Now, after a while, it's going to give me the publicly accessible IP. It just takes a while to create the Google uh, public-facing IP. Maybe now. OK, here it is. Load balancer ingress is this one. So it was running on the 19100. Now I get the same one. <laughs> and there it is. And it has the same data. It has the same job that I have created. Now there's no slaves running because I killed them. And let's fix that. I will create the slaves replication controller with just one. The file only defines one. So I can get pods running. And I have one slave running here. And it's in pending status, so it's not running yet. But as soon as it r is running, it's going to find out uh, where the, the master is. And one of the cool things, extra features that Kubernetes provides is like I can do logs of this specific pod. Still pending? OK. <laughs> there it is. And it will go and find wherever the container is running and give me the logs. So I don't have to go into the host and the nodes and SSHing and get the logs from Docker or anything like that. Kubernetes is aggregating the logs from all the running containers. And I can see attempting to connect to this address. So it's Jenkins is using the DNS uh, master, the DNS name. And it should be showing up here. So it, I have one running. Now, let's uh, scale this up and make it a lot more useful. And uh, I think I did two. Yes, I did two. I get the pods, and now I have two slaves running. And the same thing. It's going to come up here, and it is available to run jobs. So if I click. Uh, and schedule builds, and I can click as many times as I want, it's going to run the job in the slaves. So if I want to go ahead and say I want 20 of them, I don't have to say go and start this, go and start that. Just make sure there's 20 of them. And if I kill the host, it's going to restart 20 of them in whatever the, the uh, node it wants to. So I can get pods. I have 20, some of them running, some of them pending. And they will start showing up on Jenkins. So that's basically what you can do very easily. Um, I don't know how much time left. I think it's OK. Um, so I guess I'll uh, let you ask questions, and if we have some time later, I can show you how to destroy things and see them come back uh, up online. Uh, but if you have any questions now, then yeah. Uh, so uh, in Docker, when we link containers together, yep. so um, they are tied together through environment variables, why do you use host, API, IP, and uh, port? But for example, if your link is tied, so your link containers, they, uh, they uh, are left with stale environment variables, right? Yep. That, that's an issue. Uh, as I see here in pods, pod is a unit like a, a cohesive unit of multiple containers. Mm -hmm. So what happens if, for example, Jenkins master, uh, like if you have Jenkins master, uh, master and, and two slaves running in the same pod, right? So what happens if Jenkins can, uh, master container dies? Well, you don't want to do that for one particular reason. is If you have them in the same pod, they're going to always run in the same node. So 
you cannot scale that way. Um, <laughs> if they die, uh, Kubernetes will restart the container, and because they can point to each other through localhost, they will keep talking. It, it wouldn't lose anything. I mean, the, the, the variables is going to point to localhost. It's not going to point to external IP. Yeah, yeah. A pod is talk to each other on the same, each container and the pod talks to each other on localhost. Now, if I kill the Jenkins master now and it gets rescheduled in a different node, like, um, let, let's just do it. So right, right, right now you are running uh, one called a pod with Jenkins master, yep. and another one with all this client client. Yeah, replication controllers, but yeah, they are all separate pods, as you can see here. There's all, all of them. So let's let's figure out in what node this is running, uh, which is this one. Uh, let's go in. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see what. Uh, Cloud. No, it was ah oh, okay. Compute. Okay. Sudo shut down now. Okay. Okay, so the Jenkins container is no longer responding. And Let's figure out what happened, because it, that was too quick. <laughs> uh, nine AWS. OK, so it's the same one, same pod name. And it is, did it, did it go down? OK, it went down. Okay, so the host is down. I can see uh, CTL get nodes. And uh, it, I think it's gonna take a bit to figure out that it died. Um, dun, 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 dun. So let's see, let's see if it comes back. Maybe I, I did this too soon or too late. <laughs> Let's see if, if, if it comes back, uh, and we will see that it's rescheduled in a different, in a different node. So the question is, what's going to happen to all the slaves? Well, it depends how you use the, the service discovery. If you use DNS, Kubernetes can update that. SkyDNS will update the IP. If you use environment variables, then it's not going to happen that. The container is started with an environment variable. It's not going to update what, in this case, what you would do is, um, I don't know if it, it does that already, but the pods, uh, as soon as they, the, the Java program, as soon as it loses connection, it may just exit. And so the container dies. And Kubernetes will notice that the container died, and it's gonna start a new one. Um, probably, it, that's, I think that's what is happening. And you can see here the number of restarts. So probably it's gonna keep restarting them until they come back. Like, let's say, logs. Okay, so it's not having network because the node is down. But at some point, Obviously, uh, you can also set uh, like uh, monitoring endpoints, so you can tell Kubernetes how often to ping some uh, IP or some uh, URL on your node, and it will maybe that way it will notice faster or slower that that the server, like here, it restarts two two times already, so at some point it's gonna be rescheduled, and the interesting thing is like the IP is not gonna change because this is basically hiding all that behind behind the the load balancer 
Yes. I have a question. What if we have more complicated tasks when you need to do some change to the uh, final nodes? For instance, I would like to run an integration test for 12 customers and each has its own data. So what solutions would I have? Well, this is a bit of like do-it-yourself uh, cluster of Jenkins slaves. And, uh, so it will run certain script on every node that is read or no? If, if you have different types of slaves, you can have different types of rep replication controllers, and you can say, I, ha I want to have 10 slaves of this with this Docker image, 20 or with this other Docker image. You can use for those I mean, the ideal or the best way is to use the Kubernetes Jenkins plugin that basically will you define different uh, images for different labels and then you can assign jobs to those slaves and it will create them automatically. But th I mean, this is just the basic example of how to not entering into Jen Jenkins details on how to uh, have service discovery and replication and, and disaster recovery. More questions? No? Okay. Um, well then I think um, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> How difficult? To reproduce the trees that you have been now in Deep City. So, what are the steps? Um, I don't know. It depends on on how Team City works with the slaves and, and things like that. I'm not familiar with Team City, um, but yeah. Okay. Jakuya.